Open up your Bibles. Open up your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Keep your hands there and then turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Daniel chapter 3, that's in your Old Testament. Daniel chapter 3 in your Old Testament. And then after that, I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2 in your New Testament. And give me an amen when everyone's there. Unless I'm not there yet, in which case, keep silent. 2 Timothy Timothy chapter 3. Or chapter 2, I mean. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Okay, keep your hand on Daniel 3, and I'm going to read from 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm going to read verse 3. The Bible says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier in Christ. Okay? I want everyone to keep that in mind. Now, we, as, we turn to second, uh, as we turn to Daniel 3, I, I want to just introduce some, some ideas. Now, for those of you that don't know, for those of you that don't know, us Christians, we have three enemies in this world. We have three enemies. The devil, the flesh, and the world. Those are our three enemies. Anything you have to contest with in this day and age is going to be one of those three. It's going to fit in one of those three camps: the devil, the flesh, and the world. And if you're not contesting with with at least one of those three, I'm telling you something right now: you're doing something wrong. You got to see opposition from these groups. If you're not, then I'm telling you, you're not on the winning side. The Bible is very clear. But I want to focus today on the devil. The devil. And unfortunately, today we live in a day and age where the church does not want to preach about the devil. They don't want to tell you what the devil has in store for you. They don't want to tell you how the devil works and what he plans to do with you in your life. And I'm sorry to tell you, but as, as you grow in your Christian walk, you, as you get closer to God, let me tell you something. You're also going to get closer to the devil. You're also going to get closer to the devil, and that's just a plain matter of fact. The, the, the closer you get to your Lord and Savior, the closer the devil gets to you. Uh, I firmly believe that as you get closer to the Lord, he gets closer to you. And if you don't know, the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel is a prophetic book. You want to know how the Bible is true? You want to know how the Bible is real? That it tells you the truth, that this is God's word? You want to know? You look at the prophecies. You look at all the prophecies that were fulfilled in this book that, that no other book could ever possibly even hope. That no other book could ever possibly even hope to uh, have a matching track record with. That's how you know this book is real. Uh, it's a prophetic book, the book of Daniel, and it tells you all about world history. You know, the, you know Alexander the Great was, was prophesied in this book? You know, King Cyrus was prophesied in this book? You know that we know what's going to happen because of what the Bible tells us? It, it has a 100% track record. So I, I suggest you trust in this book. Now in Daniel chapter 3, we're going to see something here. How, who, who here knows who the, what the Antichrist is? Do you know what, you anything about the Antichrist? The devil, he is a counterfeiter. The devil, he wants to counterfeit everything God has. So if God has a Christ, the Lord Jesus, the devil, he wants to have a counterfeit Christ, the Antichrist. If God has a book, the King James Bible, the devil wants to have a a counterfeit book, any other Bible. And I can can tell you all about that later. Uh, The devil wants to counterfeit everything God has. Now, in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, we're going to see a king. He's by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. And he is a picture of the Antichrist, what the Antichrist is going to do. The Antichrist is a literal person who's probably walking this earth right now as we speak. And, and very soon, the Antichrist, who is the devil incarnate, is going to set up a literal one world government system in which God's people will be persecuted. God's people will be persecuted. Now, if you've been a Bible-believing Christian for at least a couple months, you probably know that we're not going to see that kingdom come to fruition entirely. You probably know that we're not going to see what what Christians we call the tribulation. That's a seven-year time period in which the devil rules on this earth, and he's going to persecute God's people. You you as Bible-believing Christians know that. But I personally, I I think we're going to start to see birthing pangs of that of that of that future kingdom coming. I personally believe that we're going to see what I, what I have no other way, better way to describe it as a free 30 day trial. All right. Amen. We're going to, you know, get, you get those free Netflix subscriptions. You probably have a burner e- email for every week of the year. Um, I think we're going to, we might see a 30 day trial of what that kingdom is going to look like. And if you don't believe me, didn't we just come out of a time frame in which, uh, you couldn't buy or sell or go into a store or, or travel unless you took some sort of mark in your arm. I think we might have seen a 30-day trial, and I think we're going to see another one pretty soon before before the Antichrist comes and we get raptured up into heaven. So I want everyone here as Christians to be prepared, because uh, I, I, 
we, we're going to have to endure hardness as good soldiers. You think that the Bible tells you that, that all that live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. All that live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. Now, have you been suffering persecution lately? Yeah. Let me tell you something. You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. The persecution that we I want you to be prepared for, I'm telling you, this is going to be the kind of persecution you're going to see in, in Daniel chapter 3. You know, it's a, it's commonly said, you know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. And I want to prepare you as a, as a congregation to hope for the best, our blessed hope, but you better prepare for the worst. Now, I like I said, I'm of the belief that Christians, we're going to suffer more physical persecution before the Antichrist comes and sets up its kingdom. Now... Daniel chapter 3, I want to start reading it. I want to start reading it, but let me go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3 again. I want to show you one more thing before we start. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days, the last days, we are in the last days right now. Can we all agree upon that? We are in the last days right now. The Bible tells us in the last days, perilous times shall come. Perilous. You know what that means? Dangerous times shall come in the last days. And Apostle Paul, he's not talking to tribulation Jews. He's talking to, his church. He's talking to the church, us. He's warning us that perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. That describes the day we live in to a T. Yeah. And the Bible tells us from such turn away. We're not supposed to be lumped in with that crowd that are heady, high-minded, truce breakers, covetous. Uh, we're not supposed to be lumped in with that crowd. So let's go to Daniel chapter 3. I'm going to introduce you to some people. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura and in the province of Babylon. Now let's pause right here. I want you to pay attention. When the Bible says in Daniel chapter 3, the word set up, the word set up, the devil is setting up his kingdom as we speak. He is setting up his kingdom. And <clears throat> as I told you before, the Antichrist is a picture, or Nebuchadnezzar is a picture of the Antichrist. So what Nebuchadnezzar is going to do in this chapter, the Antichrist is also going to do in the yeah. tribulation. So pay attention. <clears throat> the, the topic of the, the name of the sermon is the devil's a game the devil's a game and the first thing I want you to pay attention to I'm gonna read verses 1 to 7 it's the devil's administration the devil's administration let's go from verse 2 then Nebuchadnezzar king the king sent to gather the princes the governors and the captains the judges the treasurers the counselors the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the the, de the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up then the princes and the governors and captains and the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, Ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a, fire, of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore at the time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music. Notice that all kinds of music. Uh, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now the devil's administration, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar, he sets up an image of worship. An image of worship that he's going to command every single person in the kingdom to worship. He's going to command worship just like the Antichrist is going to command worship. And let me tell you something, it's not optional. You are going to be forced, or Jews in the tribulation are going to be forced to worship the Antichrist. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right now, don't, don't go so far as to think you're not out of the neck of the woods. 
you might be expected to bow the knee in some way or shape or form. You might be expected to sell out your Lord and Savior for, for peace and safety before the tribulation comes. Because that's ultimately what the devil wants from the world, from you. He wants to steal glory away from God and, and, and give it unto himself. Now, everything that the devil has, everything that, that comes from the devil is geared toward that express intent of taking glory from God and giving it and stealing it and giving it to himself. And I, I want you to notice something here. The devil, he uses music. The devil, he uses music. Okay? You realize there's no such thing that, every, that music is designed to be spiritual. It's designed to elicit a spiritual response. Why do you think people go drive hundreds of miles to go listen to a concert, to go to a concert event where they sweat their their they sweat their brains out and they they're packed together like sardines and they then they get into a trance okay why do you why do you think that happens there's something spiritual going on there okay the bible says in james chapter 4 verse 4 ye adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with god Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is, a, is the enemy of God. Now, let me ask you something, Chris, uh, Christians. Who is your friend here? Who are you friends with? Are you friends with your coworker? Do you go out and drink every night with them? Do you hang out and just go on smoke breaks with them? Do you like to just go to these concerts and just and, and make a fool of yourselves, dress scantily clad, uh, reveal yourself, your bodies, and, and, and be a part of the world to the point where no one would ever look at you and think you're a Christian? If you do, let me tell you something. You're not friends with God. You're friends with the world. And I'm ask, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this not to, not to scare you, not to put you down. But listen, you need to pick a side. You need to pick a side. Now, as we go on into Jan Daniel chapter 3, I want you to be aware of something. The devil has his, his administration. And you know what that administration is going to do? The devil is going to have an assault. An assault. Okay, let's read verses 8 to 12. 8 to 12. The devil is going to assault people. And who, who is that? You'll find out. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 3, verses 8 to 12, Wherefore, at the time certain Chaldeans came near and accused, accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the harp, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worship that image, or worship, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Let's pause here. Now, <clears throat> I want you to be aware of something. <coughs> Go to Romans 13. Romans 13, let me bring something to your attention. The government is supposed to be a, a help to you. The government is supposed to be helpful to you. It's supposed to be for your benefit. Now let's see what the government is supposed to function like. The Bible says in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that, are, that be are ordained of God. Okay, God set these governments up uh, above you, and they're of God. Now to rebel against the government, that's to rebel against God. But let, let, there's a silver lining here. There's a silver lining here. When the government is against God, you are against the government. Amen? Amen. The Bible says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, the resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now let's pause here. Is that talking about your eternal security? No. No. That is not talking about your eternal security. Verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to, their, to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be, uh, be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Now the government is supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to be against evil. Now... I, there used to be a gay pride flag right there at City Hall. Thank God they took it down. But let me tell you something. The government is no longer against evil. Yeah. The government is no longer for God. 
Those days are long since God gone. The government is now in the back pocket of the devil. Okay, the, the Bible says the devil is the god of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. You have to be aware of what the devil, what the devil's rulership is over. Now, we live in strange times, amen? We live in strange times where the assault isn't coming in the form of public executions. Christians in America, we're, we're pampered. We have it so good. You realize over a th less than 400 years ago, Christians were, getting, Christians were getting executed. They were getting tortured. They were getting public shame rituals. It wasn't cool to be a Christian. It wasn't good to be a Christian back then. You, would ex you were expected to be able to give your life for your Lord and Savior 400 years ago. Now, we live in a day where that is, that, that, those days are that's like a fairy tale to us. Okay? But let me tell you something. The devil... He, he assaulted us in a way that we never thought would happen. We never thought was possible. He's used technology. He's used, uh, uh, he's used complacency. He's discouraged us. He's deluded us. He's deceived us. He's been able to peer pressure us into doing what he couldn't do with public execution, with, with torture, with murder. He's been able to cripple the Christians of this day and age in a way that he, he couldn't do by slaughtering us by the thousands. He got us to he got us to forfeit our own rights. Yeah. Now I want to I want to go off the script here real quick, and I want to explain to you something here. There is something in the Bible called the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam. Now the doctrine of Balaam. If you go to Numbers twenty two, you're going to see something happen here, where God's chosen people, God's people, the Jews in the Old Testament, God. He, he blessed them. And the Bible says that, that you can't bless what God, or you can't curse what God has cursed, and you can't bless what God is, or you can't bless what God has cursed, and you can't curse what God has blessed. Paraphrasing there. Um, and God, he blessed the Jews. So there's a guy named Balaam. <coughs> and, and a king came up to him with a proposition saying, hey, if you can curse these Jews, because I know you're a powerful man, that you're able to curse and you're able to bless. Uh, if you can curse these Jews and get them to stumble and get them to falter, we will pay you. We will, we will, you will be treated well. And Balaam, he, he, he's like, I can't curse them. God's already blessed them. I can't, but I, I want that money. Let me, let me go back and let me see if I can think of a way to do it. And he, and he thinks, and he thinks, and he thinks. And long story short, he thinks of a way to finally curse the Jews in a way that it's not him actually doing it. The Jews are the ones cursing themselves. So what's he do? He tells the, he tells the, the heathen Gentile king, hey, I know how you can get them. You bring your women and your men, you have them intermingle with those Jews, and you bring in their outside gods and their worship services and their styles of music and, and all their things that are worldly, that are not of God, and you bring it in to the group of the, the people of God. You bring it to them, and you have them integrated into their own form of worship, integrated into their own, into their own form of culture. And what happened is once they, they sullied themselves, they defiled themselves, God, he was no longer blessing them. Why? Because they cursed themselves. They brought in the world into the, into the people of God. They brought in the world into the church. You have to be very aware of churches that are worldly. Churches that worship how I just worship the way I want to worship. I think we can all worship God the way that, way that we, we, we have our own truth. Nuh uh There's one truth. Okay? And you have to be very wary of the doctrine of Balaam. Why do you think the Catholic Church, they've been, they've been trucking along so, so long and they've been just so powerful? Because they always integrate the world into their form of worship. They always adapt to the time period in which they live in and try and, and, and affect the, the ma most majority of people. And that's how they manage to stay relevant. But is that right? No. Is that godly? No. It's worldly. And that's exactly what the devil is going to do. <clears throat> in, in, the, in the tribulation, the government system is going to be a religious system. In the tribulation, they're going to have a form of worship that takes in, uh, that's going to be using the Catholic Church. And if you don't believe me, read the book of Revelation. You're going to see, you're going to see Roman there beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, anyway, my, my rant is over, but I, I want you to be, a, I want you to know that. You have to be aware of worldly churches. We can't all be serving God, right? We can't all be right. There has to be someone that's doing it right. And that's why I'm glad that you chose to come to a Bible-believing church, a church that takes the Word of God seriously. The current landscape of America, of the world, really means that Christians who are going to stand for Christ are like a stubborn nail. And the nail that sticks up is the one that gets the hammer. 
So you better be re ready and prepared to, to suffer persecution, to suffer opposition. Because you know what? Let me tell you something. The devil is angry. The devil is furious with Christians that want to do right by God. The devil, is, the devil hates you. Go to, go to Daniel chapter 3. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3 again. And we're going to read verses 13 and 18. We're going to see a picture of the devil's anger towards God's people. Towards God's people. Now the Bible says in Daniel chapter 3 verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are the, those are the Jews. Then they brought these men before the king. <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, <coughs> and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of that of a burning fiery furnace and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands Shadrach Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king O Nebuchadnezzar we are not careful to answer thee in this matter if it be so our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand O king but if not be it known unto thee O king that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up amen you know the devil is like a roaring lion and he's seeking whom he may devour the devil he wants to devour any Christian that's so foolish as to think that he can that he can get away with it that he can that he can get out of the devil's sights and he's angry with every single Christian that wants to do right. Now these Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did nothing wrong. They were doing exactly as they were told to. And, they, and let me tell you something. Most Christians start off that way. Most Christians start off with good intentions. Amen? You know, Billy Graham, he had good intentions. That, there's no two ways around it. Listen, he did some great work. But the world got into him. And he got into the world. But the correct response to have when the devil, he, the devil wants to, he wants to tempt you. He wants to scare you into buckling. He wants to scare you into caving under the pressure. And, and, and all, so he can steal glory from God and take it and keep it for himself. And the correct response is exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They said, we are not careful to answer you, king. We're not careful. We didn't close our doors when COVID came around. The Bible says don't, to not forsake the gathering. We didn't forsake the gathering. How many churches did? How many churches decided, oh, we're just going to do Zoom meetings. It's just not safe. You know, there are Christians 2,000 years ago, they're willing to get their heads, their heads cut off to come to church. Now I have Christians that, oh, my, my, I just can't make it. I, I don't feel good. I, I, think, I think I have COVID. <laughs> hey, I want, I, want you, I want you to understand that other parts of the world you, you have people risking their lives to come to church. That's still happening today. You go to China, you go to the Middle East where people, it is, it is, it is, it is worthy of execution to be a Christian in, some, in places like that. Iran, Iraq, places like that. You don't, you don't want, to pe uh, want people to know that you're a practicing Christian. But you know what? They go to church anyway. How spoiled are we that we forsake the gathering? Why? Because I, gotta, I, I just can't afford the Uber. Call me, I'll pick you up. I don't know. I, I just, my dog is sick. Can you be sick for an hour without you being there? You know, people make excuses. Why? Because we're catered. Yeah, get a cat. <laughs> Listen, what, what kind of Christian are you going to be when, when it really hits the fan? What kind of Christian are you going to be when, when, when the least of your worries are the bus schedule? What kind of Christian are you going to be when, when, oh, it's just too hot today. I can't make it. We're all sweating here, right? I'm not the only one. Many Christians start off with good intentions. Remember, the devil, what did he do when he tried to tempt Christ? He tried to give him all the things that, that, that were already his. It was, it, was, it was his, but it just wasn't the right timing. You realize what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did is they, they said, we're not careful to answer you, king. And God's going to deliver us. And you know what? Even if he doesn't, even if God doesn't deliver me, I'm not going to worship you. I don't care if I die. I don't care if I have to go through that fiery furnace. I'm not going to buckle under the pressure of worshiping the devil. Amen. You know, humans are designed to worship. We all have, we all worship something. There are, there's always something in our lives that takes precedence over God. 
if you're if you're not a uh, if you're not a Bible believing Christian. Now, who is on the throne in your heart? I want you to ask yourself that. Is it God or is it is it my friends and family? Is it my job? Is it my is it my comfort? Is it my peace? Is it my household? Is it my finances? What what is taking precedence over God? You realize God can deliver you from all your problems. You don't have to focus on those things in your life that are causing you to worry because because you can just put that in God's hands. Amen. Go to verses 19 to 26. 19 to 26, the Bible says, Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage, his visage is his face, his visage is his face, was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <coughs> Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Okay, that, that furnace that they, that they had, it was seven times hotter than it should have ever been heated to. And she, the Nebuchadnezzar, he was mad, man. These, these Jews, they don't want to worship me? Well, let me tell you something. We serve a mighty God. Amen. The Bible says in verse 20, or verse 20, yeah, verse 20. And he commanded, he commanded the most mighty men, the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the, the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen and their hats and their other garments and were cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace was exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's how hot this fire was. It was so hot, if you got near to it, you'd just die. Verse 23, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, that's astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the, unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, look. I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. The form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake, and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth uh, of the midst of the fire. So what we saw here was the devil's astonishment. The devil's astonishment, and the devil will be astonished when you decide not to buckle under his pressure. When you decide, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to worship you. I'm not going to, I'd, I'd rather die than worship the devil. Yeah. And the devil will be astonished. Did you know that God and the devil, you know God and the devil have conversations about you? Did you know that? The devil's name, what's it mean? Sa Satan, the word Satan means the accuser. And the devil is always accusing you towards God. Always accusing you towards God. You and the God and the devil have conversations about you, and that's a scary thought. But you know what? God doesn't. If we get our sins forgiven, He doesn't see the sins that the devil is pointing out. He doesn't see. Hey, did you see what Vincent did last night? Did you see what Lewis was talking about? I hope not. Did you hear that? And you know what God says? No, I didn't hear that. Why? Because there's two things God can't do two things God can't do. God cannot lie and he cannot remember a sin that's been covered under the blood of the Lord Jesus. He cannot remember those sins. Those are two things he can't do. But you know what's a scarier thought? Yeah, it's scary to think that the devil is bringing, constantly bringing all your faults up to God. But you know what's scarier? The scariest words that a Christian can, that, that, that God can speak about a Christian? Hast thou considered my servant Vincent? Hast thou considered my servant Thalia? When a Christian is doing so great, when a Christian is serving the Lord, the God, he wants to bring you up. Why? Because the devil's going to say, Thalia doesn't really love you, God. Vincent doesn't really care. If you took all that you, got, that you gave him from, from him, he would curse you to your face. Those are scary words for God to say to the devil because the devil, he's going to try and call the Lord's hand. But the only reason the Lord brings that up is because he knows, now my servant, he's not going to buckle under the pressure. He knows when he has a real one. And you know what? God wants to show the devil how wrong he is. He wants, he wants the glory. The, the, God deserves all the glory. And God loves to use a righteous Christian. God loves to use a righteous Christian. The kind of faith that astonishes the devil is the kind of faith and trust where you fear God and trust him so much that you'd rather die than buckle to the devil's whim. That's the kind of faith the Lord wants to use. You, you realize that the, that the Lord God of heaven, you can do something that he will thank you for? 
You realize how profound that is? Go to, go with me to sec, uh, First Peter. First Peter. There's something you can do that God will thank you for. First Peter is in the New Testament. First Peter. First Peter chapter two, verses eighteen to twenty-one. The Bible says. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For, uh, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. The thing that you can do to, that God will thank you for is when you suffer wrongfully, when you were innocent and you did nothing wrong, but you suffered anyway. That's what God will thank you for. But how many people take that for granted? How many people think, oh God, why would you let me suffer? This is you're not really righteous. You're just mean. You don't care about me. But God, that's what he's going to thank you for. When you suffer right, when you suffer wrongfully, when you didn't deserve it, and God thanks you for it afterwards. But you want to you want to just throw that blessing back at God. You don't want to have anything to do with it. Why? Because you'd rather be comfortable down here. Because you'd rather en enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. But God, he wants to give you something. He wants to have fellowship with you. You realize the only way to have fellowship with Jesus Christ is to suffer? The only way to have fellowship with Jesus Christ is to suffer. That's the only way you can grow in similarity to him. That's the only way that you can become more like him is if you suffer. If you suffer wrongfully, when, when you did nothing wrong, when you were innocent. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there's no two ways around it. These men were innocent, and they were not careful to answer the king. And I want you to, I want you to be able to say the same thing. I'm not careful to answer you. I'm not careful to answer anyone that wants to, to insult your God, that wants to make you buckle under the pressure that wants to make you uh, be something less than a Christian. <clears throat> God loves to use a righteous Christian. And you want to be the man God is using or the woman that God is using. It, it, it's really encouraging to know that, that God, he's put his hand on you. He's given, he's, he's give, uh, put his blessings upon you. That when you go out and you, and you give someone the gospel, that the Lord uses it. That the Lord allows you to be used by him <clears throat> someone that when the time comes you'd be willing to dive headfirst in that fiery burning furnace so that you could hear those blessed words thank you thank you for coming thank you for, for for standing boldly thank you for making a stand for my son's name the devil has an antagonist he has an antagonist and that's the lord you realize that go to verse 27 that we're on the winning side Daniel chapter 3 verse 27 and the princes governors and captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power nor was an hair of their head singed neither were their coats changed nor the smell of fire had passed on them <coughs> then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language would speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. When God has put his hand upon you, it is evident. When God has put his hand upon you, people will realize that that there is one true God, that well, your testimony has power. I'm willing to bet that, that because of your testimony, people have gotten saved if you've, been, if you've lived the righteous Christian life. That when they look upon you, they think there's something different about that brother or sister. There's something different that, that I kind of want that. I kind of want the peace that Sister Thalia has. I kind of want to have the, the fortitude that Sister Callie has. I kind of want to have the patience that, that Sister Callie has with Brother Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> You got to be on the right on the right side. You can't be on the fence with God. You can't be on the fence with God. The devil owns the fence. When all is said and done, when 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 roll call is is, is coming, 
God's going to call the people on his side to his side, and the devil's going to call the people on his side to his side, and the people that are on the fence, they're going to try and get off on God's side when it's too late. And the devil says, what? No, hold up, bub. You're coming with me. I own that fence. You're on my side. You can't be on the devil's side. You can't be on the fence. We know who's going to win. If you had the chance 10 years ago to invest in Uber or Bitcoin, wouldn't you have gotten every penny that you could scrounge, everything that you had and put all you had into that one thing? If you knew the investment, the return on investment you were going to get? The Bible says in Romans 14 verse 11, for it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. <coughs> we know the end. We know what's going to happen. This prophecies, the prophecies we have in this book are sure to come. Amen. The, you realize that this Bible is more, is, is more valuable and powerful than the audible words of God? If God were to speak to you right now from heaven above, it wouldn't hold up to this book. That is how powerful this book you have in your hand. Remember, when, when, when you got to have the right book, by the way. you got to have the right book. You realize that in verse 27 or 26, when, when Nebuchadnezzar said in the fourth is like the son of God, modern versions change that verse. Modern versions change that verse. They don't say, he doesn't say the son of God. He says the sons of God or, or like a God son or son of the gods. Mm -mm. It turns out that a, that a pagan king knows more about your God than most Christians do nowadays. And that's sad. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you haven't received the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, let me tell you something. There's a place awaiting all people that reject the gift of eternal life. God has nowhere else to put a person that rejects his son but an eternal burning hell that lasts forever and ever and ever and ever and it never ends. And there's people right there t today that are going to be there tomorrow and the day after and the day after and forever and ever and, I, and God says in his word that he's not willing that any should perish. People want to pin the blame of God and say, would, why would a loving God send someone to hell? Let me tell you why. Uh, the, he's the, the, what kind of God would send a loving uh, a person to hell? The kind of God that died so you wouldn't have to go. Amen. The kind of God that, that gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. There's no other way. You can't go to Buddha. You can't go to Allah. Your, your, your government can't save you. We just proved that. Your, your, your occupation can't save you. Your husband can't save you. The only thing that can save you is the shed blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to receive the free gift, all you have to do is honestly and sincerely ask in your heart, God, my Father, I am a sinner. Repent. Ask him, God, I understand because of my sin, I deserve a burning hell. And you tell him that. And you tell him this, I ask you now to receive your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as my savior, the best way I know how. And I forsake all my righteousness and ask for the righteousness of God, that I might be saved, that I won't go to hell. And if you do that with an honest and sincere heart, God, he will save you. God will save anyone that comes to him with an honest and sincere heart. He won't turn anyone down. The question is, do you have, do you have too much pride in your heart to ask him? Most people do. Most people want to say, nah, it's just some old book. Most people want to say, thank you, brother. Most people want to say, I just don't see it. I don't think God would do that. I think my good would outweigh my bad. And I'll tell you right now, every person in hell probably said that at some point in their life. And I hope for your sakes that, that this message was a blessing to you, that you would have gotten something from it. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> I'm going to try and stick around a little bit longer and just fellowship with you, but um, I'm just grateful that you came and decided that this would be the day that you would hear the Lord's preaching and, and you would be here and, and, and have fellowship with this little church. Um, I want to close things out with a word of prayer. Father God.